Michael Lyons. I'm a staff environmental scientist and I'm into the watershed regulatory programs. So Rebecca asked me to give a seminar and I decided to talk to you about developing a comprehensive watershed wide monitoring program for surface waters since that's a lot of what I'm trying to do now. So when you put points on a map to decide how to monitor something, there are certain elements that you should consider. First of all, you want to define your objectives, decide how to pick your station location, and you need to decide what type of indicators you're going to use for your monitoring. And it helps then to figure out what your assessment thresholds are going to be. What are you going to do with the data that you get? How are you going to evaluate that data? So I'll do some of these things. And in a short time, of course, this is not exactly going to be a training class where you go out and know how to do everything. I'm just going to try to present some ideas to you about how we approach these topics. Michael? Is a slow. Do you work with any other agencies then, or? Um, you'll see in a second. This thing. Feel free to ask questions along the way. Maybe I didn't push the button hard enough. Okay. <laughs> Briefly, oh, and it doesn't get the bottom of the screen either. That may problem on, on some of these. It's going to cut off the bottom of the slide. So let's well, then we have to reduce the entire screen like it was before. Okay. That's odd. I want it that way on the recording. Okay, so I've been with the regional board for 23 years, and right now I'm the swamp. Coordinator, Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program, which basically is a statewide program trying to coordinate different monitoring efforts, and trying to make sure that statewide that we monitor our waters very well. And I'm also attached to the MPDS permitting group. I've been writing permits, permit monitoring programs for 23 years. So most of the major programs in our region have my fingerprints on them. And I am a marine biologist not an engineer. And I have a cool thing. It's the Lotus. I've had it for about six years. I have a cute dog, a little Maltese, and I like to drink beer, especially Belgian beer. And my wife there likes to drink beer, too. So. Is that a collection? That liquor store oh. <laughs> in Bruges, Belgium. So, you know, we got outside the liquor store. That's what Bruges looks like. It's a very pretty city. So it has water, has a stream running through it. So why do you monitor? There's lots of reasons. Probably one of the biggest reasons is to demonstrate compliance with permit limits. Most of you are probably familiar with that. If we're adopting TMDLs. There's usually a monitoring component that goes with that. Um, storm here, when they implement BMPs, best management practices, you want the effectiveness of those. That entails monitoring. And role to see if we're protecting beneficial uses and to see what the condition of our streams and our resources are. So a challenge to try to combine all of these things into one program. And there's a picture of me probably from 10 or 12 years ago where we were out collecting fish and got this fairly large sized largemouth bass. Biggest bass I've ever seen. Actually threw it back. We were collecting fish as part of our monitoring program. Where do you monitor? Well, there's a lot of different types of surface waters. We have coastal ocean waters, we have bays and estuaries, we have lakes and reservoirs, we 
have river streams and we have wetlands. And these are all important types of surface waters that you would want to monitor. Probably need different strategies, different types of monitoring programs to assess different water body types. And then you might want to monitor groundwater. I don't know. I don't in particular, so that's why it's so tiny. It's a surface water person, so that's what I focus on. faster on my computer. I don't know if it's the pictures that slow it down or what. You know, the desktop, there's no delay. Hmm. Well, Okay, so today I'm going to focus on freshwater streams because Swamp has put a lot of emphasis on that. We have a lot of freshwater streams in our region. These, because these are all in Europe, because my wife and I like to travel to Europe, and it's fun to see what streams look like, I think, in other areas. It's basically Rome, Florence, and then London and Paris. But freshwater streams. is this. We we have a range of different conditions in our freshwater streams. We have some streams that are fairly natural condition, but we have a lot of streams that have been highly modified. So in this case, the stream has basically been straightened. The channel has been totally straightened. Of course, the LA River is a big mass of concrete with riprap sides. And then there are some control channels that are really just solid concrete. And so that can be a challenge when you're trying to develop a monitoring program is to account for these different types of stream conditions. So today I'm going to focus on the San Gabriel watershed. It's a fairly good sized watershed. Um, the lower half of it is highly urbanized. The off is in the mountains, so it's fairly natural. And the main river runs along the edge of the water. <coughs> and then there are a few tributaries. And up in the mountains, there are a number of tributary streams. So what we talk about is how we developed a program for that watershed and try to illustrate some of the strategies we're trying to develop monitoring. So where we started was back in 2005, where most of the monitoring was to the lower portion of the watershed, this heavily urbanized area. A little bit of monitoring in the middle, no monitoring in the upper watershed at all. And there were several programs that were going on. LA County Sanitation Districts has five wastewater treatment plants that discharge on the San Gabriel system. The County Department of Public Works has some re required monitoring through their MS4 stormwater permit. And then Swamp was starting monitoring in 2005, where I was trying to decide how to spend some monitoring dollars. And then some stakeholders were doing some monitoring. So we decided that it would be useful to bring people together and try to coordinate these efforts to be more efficient and be more effective. And so I think Jack asked if we work with other agencies. Well, develop a comprehensive program, you get to work with a lot of different stakeholders. So basically, 
voluntary groups, the LA Regional Board, US EPA, Santa Ana Regional Board, Squirp was involved, LA County Sand, a bunch of different dischargers, and then some local cities and some state some uh, volunteer monitoring groups. We got these people together probably once a month for about a year to try to get through the process of defining what kind of program we wanted and working out the details. And so it, it was a lengthy and time consuming process, but as you'll see, hopefully it led to something that was pretty good. about the they, they are the only on the list. Um, they had a person who was very interested in the process and so he chose to participate. And in a lot of cases you you hold meetings, you ask people to come. If they to be active they can. If they don't want to be active they don't have to. So the city of Downey is one of those activist types. The, Jerry Green actually is the person if any of you know him, but he he was very interested in what we were doing, so he came and participated. So people, their names were up there. They were invited to participate. They probably didn't really do all that much. In, in most meetings, there's a handful of people who are really vocal and active, and then there are people who kind of sit there and go along with the program, and then people who don't come, but at the end they say, yeah, that sounds good. So that things tend to go. So this large group, the first thing that we did, and the first thing that you really should do when you're trying to design a monitoring program is define your monitoring objectives. What are you trying to accomplish? So this group came up with five things that they thought were important. You know, overall condition of the streams in the watershed, local fish safe to eat, is it safe to swim, are conditions getting better or worse in the watershed over time, and then receiving waters near the actual discharges, MPDS discharges, in this case, meeting water quality objectives. So, it or not, it probably took three or four months to come up with what the objectives are. Because you get people in a room, different programs going on, they all have different objectives, they all think that their objective is the most important objective, they all think they could possibly modify what they're doing to do something else, but after you talk for a while, you find out that what you're doing maybe is not all that different and that there is some latitude. And that happened in this case, once people came up with the objectives, they found out they all pretty much had some common interests and it wasn't that hard to get change. So I'm going to go through these objectives briefly to show you how things worked out. So what condition of streams in the watershed? Well, that's a nice objective, but you, you kind of need to narrow down some um, to figure out what you want to do. And the way programs in surface waters are working out, there's two strategies for monitoring. One is to do targeted sampling where you look at the map, you look at your watershed, you decide, I want to put a sampling station here, I want to put a sampling station there. And you get this based on, on the nature of the watershed. Maybe you want sample sampling points at the major tributaries. Maybe there is a high quality habitat that you want to keep an eye on. Maybe there are endangered species out there that you want to track. Or you have known sources of pollution. So, you know, often if you have a an outfall, you want to have monitoring stations above, you know, upstream and downstream of the outfall. So when you targeted sampling, you know, it's kind of best professional judgment where you think stations ought to go. And that's a good way of sampling in certain cases, but another that has become very popular is to do probabilistic sampling or randomized sampling. And it to be a lot better for assessing the overall condition of a watershed because your sampling points are picked in an unbiased manner and they represent a certain area and you can come up with a statistical answer to what percentage of your stream is affected or you know, what percentage is in good shape, what percentage is in bad shape. And you get a, also, along with st statistical answer, you get an estimate of the variability in your answer. And so what we tended to do is use these in combination. 
and so I'll give you a little bit of background on this. Doesn't nothing went too far. So ballistic that family, as I said, it's it's good for determining overall health of the watershed. You probably can't see this very well, but this has ten random points on it. And the main thing I wanted to point out is that the side to probabilistic sampling is, is that if you're interested in a certain a certain stream, certain segment, you're out of luck with a probabilistic design if none of your points happen to fall back there. This is where target sampling is better if you're interested in a specific area. But probabilistic, the beauty of this is that statistically you end up with a representation of the whole area, which you don't get when you do targeted sampling. And then a to remember when you, when you're doing probabilistic sampling, the magic number is 30 for statistical purposes. If you have a sample size of 30, you get an estimate that is fairly precise. If you have fewer samples, you can do it. You tend to get very high coefficient of variation. If you have more samples, it's great, but that comes at a cost. What ends up doing in the San Gabriel River watershed, we had targeted sampling at 12 stations that we were interested in, plus down in the estuary. Randomized sampling, we did stations in 2005, so we got to our magic number of 30 right away, and we could make a decent assessment. But what we also built in was this continuum of the program where every year we're doing randomized sampling at 10 stations. And so that happened in 2006, 2007, and on. So by now, we're up to 70 or 80 stations. And so we have a very good data set for assessing the overall condition of the watershed. And it's also handy because over time, you as you add more stations, you can do an assessment year and see whether conditions are getting better or worse in the watershed as a whole. And it has become a very popular way of sampling very large areas. When you do monitoring, of course, one of the key things is what are you going to monitor for? And so, what kind of indicators are you going to use? In the stream health, the way sampling in streams is working, we look at the biological community, the organisms that live in the stream. We look at the hat condition of the stream, what mutation is there, what kind of bottom sets are there. We look at siscity oftentimes. It could be water column or it could be sediment. In streams, freshwater streams, typically it's usually water toxicity. We haven't done much sediment toxicity. We at a variety of chemical measurements, and the things we're often interested in are nutrients because you get algae problems in streams. Um, we look at metals because of the toxic effects, and we look at certain organics. When you're doing, when you're going to a biological community in a stream, of course, you have to get out in the field, which is kind of fun. That means you get to leave the office. If it's not 110 degrees outside, it's usually not bad to be in the field. And you're near the water, so it's usually pretty good. But there's a couple of ways that we sample. When we look at the organisms that live in the creek, we usually use a net and collect the small insect larvae and other organisms that live in the creek. You can go these backpacks that actually produce an electric current and it runs down the pole into water and you can shock fish that way. It doesn't kill the fish, but it stuns them so that you can scoop them up with the net. And larger systems, you can actually drag a net around to collect fish. And there are ways, of course, to collect samples. One thing I wanted to mention briefly that so the state is trying to de develop biocriteria to go along with the usual chemical numbers that we have. 
and in streams, we do called bioassessment monitoring. That's looking at the group of organisms that live in the bottom of the stream. And this is pretty simplified, but what we call EPT taxa or EPT species, and lots of those usually have good conditions. And if you took entomology as I was forced to do, actually, you know, you know the E stands for Ephemeroptera, which are basically mayflies. The, the P stands for Plecoptera, which are stoneflies, and the T stands for Trichoptera, which are caddisflies. And whenever there are flies that you'll see around streams, they all have these aquatic larvae that live in the stream. And so this is actually a mayfly larvae, this is a stonefly larvae, and this is a caddisfly larvae. And we've developed indices to score the health of the stream, but in simplistic terms, when there's lots of these types of organisms, usually the stream's in good shape. And the counterpoint, there are certain species that are pollution tolerant, and when you get lots of those in the stream, that's generally an indication that you have bad water quality. And those things like misery, chironomids, and oligarchy worms, both of these, when water quality poor, tend to be present in huge numbers, so it's usually pretty easy to tell that things are going bad. And then there are a number of fly larvae and other things that show up when your water quality is bad. So basically, we, you know, we've got science have developed the scoring system, translate the number of crystals that you find in a stream into an actual score, and I'll show you a chart of how that works in a second. Are algae types? Or, or, okay, well, that's probably more than you need to know about biology. But Michael, those <laughs> species are very popular in every place, or is it just could be uh, region specific. It tends to work statewide. There are certain species or types of species that occur in high quality waters. There are certain types that occur in low quality waters. The exact portions and the exact species that are present will vary across the state, but the concept seems to work pretty much around the state. So we developed separate scoring systems for Southern California and the Sierras and the Central Valley, but they're based on pretty much the same concept. So it's, it's a pretty robust tool for scoring things up and down the state. And probably when State Board develops the biocriteria, it's based partly on this. I think it's going to be the weight of evidence, so there probably will be several factors that you combine in your assessment. but. This is going to be the anchor where you look at the critters that live there. They're responding to the condition of the stream, and they're integrating over time because they live there 24 of them, basically. And so if conditions in the stream are bad over an extended period of time, you're going to see it in the biological community. So but were those species also present, say, in other states like Florida or New it may not be the species, it can be the ecological equivalent. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't want to go into too much detail, but they, you can also look at the feeding types. You know, that in polluted waters, you tend to narrow it down to just things that like to gather crud. And so you have a limited number of feeding types. In a natural situation, you have all kinds of different feeding strategies. And so that's a, I mean, I really oversimplified how they make the the call between good and bad, but, but there are sort of things like you look at pollution tolerant, pollution intolerant species, you look at feeding strategies, and it, it actually, the type of techniques have been used in the West and, and the East as well, so it's a pretty good tool, and it's definitely the way things are headed these days. We talk a lot about toxicity testing, but it's something that we often use as a way of looking at the biological response in a stream because you can each little chemical that's in the stream, but there are thousands of chemicals you might be interested in. Toxicity is sort of a, a catch-all, you know, it's a it's a rule and then you don't have to measure each individual chemical, but if you find toxicity to
to your organisms, that's a sign that something is wrong. And then there are ways to try to piece out what's actually causing the toxicity. But typically what we do here, do toxicity where you're looking whether or not critters live or die, so you're looking at mortality. Do chronic toxicity where the critters may, but they may have impaired growth or they may have trouble reproducing. And so that's a chronic effect. And then assessment threshold is, is whether the samples are toxic or not toxic. And then you can also divide it into high, moderate, or low toxicity if you actually have a toxic signal. And that's how we tend to assess that data. But I'm not going to give a toxicity talk. And monitoring, I mean, most of you probably know this, you know, nutrients usually interested in things like ammonia, nitrates, and phosphates. Ammonia is actually toxic to a lot of aquatic critters. Nitrate and phosphates tend to be the biostimulatory substances, encourage algae growth and other undesired plant growth. Compare that to the objectives that we have in our basin plan. Metals, you know, there's a variety of metals that we look for. Organics, you know, look at DDT, even though it was banned in 1982, we still have residues of DDT in the environment. And CBs, which were an industrial lubricant, were banned in the 80s, still have residues of those around. pHs are produced through, well, there's natural sources of pHs, but they're also produced through combustion of hydrocarbons. So in LA, got a few cars on the freeways, tend to have some sources of pH. And then pesticides, there's been a shift. DDT and some of the older pesticides, chlordane, things have banned to a new wave of pesticides, including pyrethroid pesticides. And these, in particular, seem to be causing a lot of toxicity in our surface waters. And you would care those to either objects that are in CTR, California Toxics Rule, or in some cases we have basin plan objectives for those. This is just the we chose to divide up the San Gabriel River watershed. When we went to our data, there these blue stations represent the main stem of the river. Purple is what we're calling the lower watershed, and yellow is what we're calling the upper watershed. And so just kind of keep that in mind as I show a few actual data results. Assessing biological community, we've developed this index to translate the different critters that live into the stream into a number that runs from 0 to 100. 100 being a good score, 0 being a bad score. And when you graph these on the map, basically orange and red dots mean that it's, the community is in bad shape. Green dots mean that it's in good shape. And the yellow dots, which are a little hard to distinguish, means it's in between, kind of shape. And not surprisingly, the urbanized lower section of the watershed and the main stem, it's all orange and red dots. So just aren't happy down there. As you get into this natural mass upper watershed, there are a lot of green dots. So there are critters who are happy up there. Perhaps a little surprisingly, there's some orange dots, meaning that the critters aren't doing well, and then there's a number of yellow dots, meaning they're kind of in between. And so, if you're four, we never monitored this area. And part of the reason was supplements aren't really sources of pollution that are obvious. You would expect things to be pretty good up there. But when you go out and sure, you find out, well, maybe it's not as good as we thought. So. One of the things when you're designing a monitoring program, you know, be careful about what assumptions you make because it seems logical to think something is either going to be bad or going to be good. It may not turn out that way, so it's often good to make sure you, you check. And in this case, we were rather surprised at the extent of less than good conditions when you look at the biological community. And you something similar to habitat. We have what's called 
Um, it's a California rapid assessment method. Basically, you go out and score various features of habitat, how good is the vegetation, how, how good is the substrate, how much meandering is there in the stream, and you come up with a score. And basically, just wanted to show the upper watershed. This is lower watershed in the main stem. You can see the upper watershed gets really good scores for habitat, which is probably not so because you're up in the mountains. It hasn't been turned into concrete and totally channelized, whereas here there have been a lot of alterations. Way to actually put a numerical value onto that. <laughs> and when you look at toxicity, often the reason that we use is Syria Daphnia, which is a, a water flea. This is it. It's a small freshwater crustacean, basically. So we do acute and chronic testing, and this is real to see, but essentially, we were in 22 sites over five years. We got 11% toxicity during those five years. So, you know, percent a lot, but it's kind of on the margin of where we start to, to get concerned. You know, if it were percent, we'd probably say, well, that's just sort of random noise. I'm not going to get too excited. You get to 10% effects, start to think maybe something is going on. And it's kind of interesting, if you look at the lower watershed, this heavily urbanized area, 5% of the time we had toxicity over the five years. So that's not really a lot. And in these upper sites where it's undeveloped and we wouldn't really have expected much to be going on, we actually got 6% toxicity over the five years. So toxicity than we would have thought in the upper watershed, and, and I don't know why that happened. But it's kind of here. Overall, not a lot of toxicity, so it's somewhat reassuring. And then you know, we do chemical monitoring to see if this is lead, nickel, selenium, zinc. And what often happens is that in the upper watershed, you have a very low metals levels, and then to have somewhat higher metals levels in lower and main stem stations. And then for zinc, in the main stem, we had high levels for zinc, which zinc is something that tends to run off from roads in your water runoff. So we're thinking that the main stem just has too many freeways around it, and so it's probably a good source of zinc there. But you can do this for various parameters. Um, phosphorus and nitrogen, we see somewhat the same pattern, although so, for some reason, orthophosphorus, which is actually the form of phosphorus that the plants can use along with the nitrogen, was pretty high in the upper watershed. Typically, in mountain streams, you would expect to see very little phosphorus. So, I'm not sure why there's so much phosphorus up there. Total phosphorus was actually pretty low, but the form that's going to cause problems was a little bit higher than we would have expected, but still not as high as we saw in the lower portion of the watershed. And the nitrates were definitely higher in the lower portion in the main stem than on the upper watershed. Something that people are interested in is to eat local fish that you catch in your watershed. And so here we decided made sense, obviously, is to target the places where people fish. So, one advantage is to having 10 or 12 or 15 stakeholders who are familiar with the region is they can tell you pretty much exactly where people go in their areas. And so we ended up picking these several areas that people fished, you know, a lake and a couple of reservoirs, and then a few places in the river, and the lake here, and then down in the estuary, there are a couple places. And so, we base targeted those those areas to do our sampling. As fish accumulate contaminants, fish live for several years. It's going to take a while for them to change. So we're only sampling every one, three years, depending on location. And this is probably not going to come out very well. But basically, when we looked at mercury, you know, we looked at various places. And the areas that are 
blood and color are the only places where mercury was at a level of concern. So all species, catfish and, and the mollusk and tilapia and the sunfish have levels of mercury, so don't have to worry about that. But in put stone, like we're putting stone in our the large bass had mercury at levels where you'd have to reduce your consumption because of the risk of adverse effects from mercury. And at say dam, this number in paint actually exceeds the no consumption level. So any any bass from Santa Fe dam reservoir and then carp, which don't tend to accumulate as highly as bass do, even in the carp in Santa Fe dam, they had high enough levels where you would have to restrict your consumption of carp. Like me, you wouldn't eat carp in the first place because I don't like carp are that tasty, but there are people who consume carp. And the thing the public is interested in is it safe to swim. So at the fishing, we decided to target the areas where people actually swim or, or recreate. The one is out that even though we use the term safe to swim, it's basically a surrogate for our Rec 1 beneficial use, and it includes things like being in water skiing and surfing and fishing. So it's not just people out there swimming laps in the river. So what we're doing, we looked at eight popular recreational sites, and then we five sentinel sites, which are above major confluences, and then we also looked down the estuary. And we coli as the indicator for certain sites and did it weekly during the warm months of the year. And then for the estuary, we did indicators total and fecal coliform and enterococcus and that twice a week year round. And I'm not going to go into the reasons for that because in the interest of time, but basically, this is hard, but any place that it is the lighter color is where the samples exceeded our basin plan standard. And you can see that that's quite a bit. Some of these sites, and all of the sites had a fair amount of exceedances. So at these different sentinel sites, it would not be safe to swim most of the time. So it wasn't surprising to us because there are a lot of sources of bacteria and have high values in a lot of our streams. But it was interesting to see how ubiquitous the problem was. These were the sentinel sites in our various tributaries. And so this kind of looking at the idea, is the watershed itself exceeding standards? When we looked at places where people actually swim, various sites, and these dark, there's two, area, two sites that have we got these bold numbers. That means they exceeded a standard. So unlike the sentinel sites, at the places where people actually swim, we're actually meeting the standard virtually all the time. So and it turns out these are in the upper, upper portion of the watershed, and it's actually safe to swim up there. So it was interesting. Because although the bulk of the watershed has bacteria problems, fortunately the places where people choose to swim or recreate not really a problem. That was the good news. And this is not that exciting, but, you know, one of the questions is, are conditions getting better or worse over time? And obviously, if you measure for four or five years, you're going to get a graph of your different levels. And you can see, in some cases, it's pretty steep. In a few cases, things bounce around. And so it's really, with only five years, in some cases, to, to say that there's a trend, but certainly it's not always that stable. And, and these, it's like seven or eight sites where we went out every year, and some of them behave pretty much the same, but there are a few of these sites where they're occasionally high and occasionally low, and we still don't really know why that is. But that's that's how we do trend monitoring. And you can do the same thing. These are different chemicals. You can just see that things do bounce around a lot. This one is a little bit interesting. When we looked at the toxicity 
toxicity to the apnea is acute toxicity. Most years actually consistently pretty good. But for some reason, in 2008, most of the stations took this drop where there was a bit more toxicity than we had observed in the past. And look at the chronic toxicity. It's a similar pattern. I mean, some of the stations weren't doing that well even in previous years, but there seemed to be this really steep drop in 2008. So don't know if it happened in 2008. I mean, it could be that it was a drop year and there, and there is more concentration of pollutants in the in the watershed. We know, but it's interesting. You do this kind of monitoring, and you do over time. Sometimes you do pick up a signal, and then you have to do further investigation to try to figure out the cause. And really, not going to work too well. But the question we had in mind was: Are receiving waters near discharges meeting water objectives? And basically. If you were chronic water quality objectives, all of these numbers for these different chemicals are 90% or some of them are 100%. So it turned out low our major discharge points, they in fact consistently meeting their water quality objectives. And sorry, this isn't more clear. And just back to what I mentioned near the start, you know, when, when we our collaboration effort, we all this monitoring concentrated in the low portion of the watershed, nothing happening in the upper portion. But after getting together and monitoring for a few years, you can see that you get better spatial representation. And so we have samples throughout the watershed, and we have a much better picture of what's going on. And so we view this as a pretty successful. And in fact, within State swamp program. This bird is kind of the model for what other regions would like to be doing. They, they'd like to bring their various programs together and have this kind of success. And in fact, I've done this for the LA River and currently working with the Santa, Santa Clara River watershed people to try to get them to do this. And then when we adopted the Los Virgenses Tapia permit, we put a requirement that they come up with this kind of effort for the Malibu Creek watershed. So it's it's a pretty good process, but it does take time and effort. And you know, it's supposed to be a sunset. It's kind of hard to tell. Or Eiffel Tower in Paris. So that's the end of what I have.